Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, evening, or morning to all of you, depending on which of the many time zones and jurisdictions you are joining us from. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's webinar on containership casualties. On behalf of both the LSLC, where I'm proud to be a long-serving board member, and under whose auspices the event takes place uh, today as part of their highly regarded annual lecture program, and also uh, on behalf of my own firm, HFW, as your remote hosts today. Also, of course, on behalf of our, of our co-protagonists, Messrs. Richard Hogg Lindley and Chambers 7 KBW. First, a few housekeeping points. Um, as you know, I think you all, most of you are, will be pretty zoomed out over the last year. And as you know, the standard procedure here is that audience participants but uh, participants are muted, but you um, are please free to submit any questions using the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screens. And then secondly, a recording of the webinar and slides uh, will be circulated after the event. So if you drop off or uh, whatever, you won't miss out on anything. Um, in terms of running order for today, um, I will shortly introduce our chairman, Mr. Justice Picken who will then run the panel and introduce the three speakers in turn at the commencement of their respective slots, uh, <clears throat> which will be about 15 minutes each. At the end of the panel discussion, we are hoping to find time for 15 to 20 minutes of questions. Um, <clears throat> we have already received some questions in advance, but please do feel free to submit any further questions using the tab I referred to earlier and we will do our best to get to as many of these as possible. Now, without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce our chairman this afternoon, Mr. Justice Pitkin of the Commercial Court. Uh, Sir Simon Pitkin, sorry, 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 I've, I've, Sir Simon, I've got to just give a, a brief bio for you. <laughs> um, Sir Simon Pitkin was called to the bar in 1989 after studying at Cardiff University and then Cambridge, where he obtained a starred first class uh, uh, LLM. His practice was in the commercial, was in, in commercial law with a particular emphasis on insurance and reinsurance, oil and gas, professional negligence, and shipping. He was a tenant of 7KBW, and it is interesting that one of his former pupils, and now a very successful barrister in his own right, Richard Saul, is one of our panelists today. So we'll see how the former master and pupil get on on this panel. Um, so Simon is co-author of the leading book, Good Faith and Insurance Contracts, and was appointed QC in 2006. He was made, before that, he'd actually been made a recorder in 2005, and became a deputy high court judge in 2010. He was the commercial law QC to the Welsh government from 2009 until 2015. He was also the QC Church Commissioner appointed by the Archbishops of Canterbury, uh, of the Archbishops of Canterbury and York between 2013 and 2015. Then um, in June 2015, he was elevated to the bench with an appointment uh, as a High Court judge in the Queen's Bench Division, after which about a year later, as I understand it, he moved within the judiciary uh, uh, to an appointment as a judge of the commercial court where he where he presently sits. Um, I should mention Sir Simon is, is also the senior judiciary's representative on the European network of councils for the judiciary and the high court representative in the International Association of Judges. Um, <clears throat> however, closest to his own heart, I suspect, are, are connections with Wales, where he is, um, he chairs the Wales Training Committee of the Judicial College, and is currently, um, and has been since 1918, the senior presiding judge of the Wales Circuit. Indeed, he, is, he has made time to join us this afternoon in the midst of a very heavy, of very heavy trial commitments in the Principality, and we are most grateful to you for that, Sir Simon. Uh, and with that, over to you. 
Thank you very much indeed. It's my pleasure to be um, here, albeit uh, only virtually like everybody. Um, I was a bit alarmed when Jonathan just described me as having been presiding judge for Wales since 1918. Um, I hope I don't look quite that old. Um, but anyway, I pun, so. <laughs> it is true to say that I am in my fourth year. Um, it's also true to say that, um, as um, uh, Jonathan just alluded to, I'm currently sitting in Newport in South Wales in week seven or eight of a very heavy murder trial. And uh, it may be of interest um, that I feel especially well qualified to chair today's session because the very unfortunate um, uh, incident which has led to this trial uh, um, involved the discovery of a uh, body uh, in the uh, intermodal yard, the container yard, in other words, in Barry Docks. Indeed, I took um, the jury on a visit there um, at the start of the year, and um, it uh, felt in one sense quite um, as though I was coming home because there were all sorts of containers all around us. Obviously, it's a serious matter, having said all that, so I do not jest. But I feel um, especially qualified, therefore, to chair today's session, given the um, case I'm currently doing. Um, now, we all know that uh, container ship casualties have become an important class of case for the London shipping law community, even if uh, they have only rarely come up for decision in the courts. And this webinar, um, through our illustrious speakers, and I hope um, a healthy set of questions and an even healthier set of answers, uh, seeks to illuminate the issues involved in the complex cases uh, uh, by drawing on the perspectives of three different types of practitioner, a casualty lawyer, Andrew, an average adjuster, Amy, and a shipping barrister, uh, Richard. Um, so I hope it's going to be a worthwhile session. In fact, I don't hope, I know it's going to be a worthwhile session. And um, with that uh, introduction uh, and re repeat of my uh, delight at being asked to chair this event, I'd like um, in the first instance to, well, just briefly to say who our speakers are, but I'm then going to save the more detailed introductions um, for uh, uh, just before each of the speakers actually speaks. I've referred to um, Amy, Amy O'Neill, who uh, joins us from Richards Hogg Lindley. And as I say, I'll say more about her later. She's the second of our speakers. Um, uh, Richard Saul, who uh, as, um, has been um, already mentioned, um, uh, is a barrister in Seven Kings Bench Walk, the chambers where I spent about 25 years um, and indeed worked with Richard uh, on a number of cases. And then Andrew Chamberlain, Global Head of Admiralty and Crisis Management at HFW. And so can I just say a little bit more about Andrew? And then as I say, at each stage, I'll say more about Amy and then um, uh, Richard. Andrew uh, joined the Royal Navy in September 1985, serving at sea on the Invincible in the Ark Royal before completing a Navy sponsored degree in geography and economics at the University of London. After graduation in 1989, Andrew returned to sea on the HMS Nottingham, completing a tour of the Gulf, and then, um, and, and indeed acting as escort to the Royal Yacht Britannia during her Far East tour. Andrew then left the Navy in 1990 and completed his legal studies at the then Richards Butler, now of course Reed Smith in 1992. He qualified as a solicitor in 1994, joining Home and Fenwick and Willens Admiralty Department in September of that same year. He has been a partner at HFW since 2003. He specializes in salvage, collision, total loss and oil pollution cases, although he also handles the full range of marine litigation, including charter party disputes and the like. I don't think you need to hear uh, more from me, um, save to observe that like all of our speakers, it's quite plain that Andrew is a true expert. And with that introduction, I now hand over to Andrew. So Simon, thank you very much. Jonathan, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> can we have the next uh, slide, please? Um, thank you for that generous introduction. And thank you everyone for dragging yourselves away from your BBC News app, where uh, news of our new freedoms is uh, hitting the internet. Um, so I have to compete with that, I suppose. Um, Right, as Sir Simon says, we have three speakers and it falls to me um, uh, to set the table for this. Um, and I'm going to talk about the legal and practical aspects of managing container ship casualties. Um, so the first slide is just to give you a bit of a, an overview of what we're going to talk about. 
um, you can't talk about container ship casualties really without focusing on just how enormous they've become um, in recent years. And that does mean checking in with three well-known, uh, relatively recent casualties, the MSC Napoli, the Chitra and the Rena, small vessels by modern standards, but each of them giving rise to startlingly large claims. Obviously, we are now into the realms of the 20,000 TEU and larger. I think 23,000 TEU is now the, the largest afloat. And we'll bring ourselves up to date by looking at some uh, more recent, very large container ship casualties, the Merce Conum and the Antion Express. I'll then drill down into the practical aspects, the legal aspects. Um, really in the time available, there's, it's not possible to do all of these topics justice, but I'll try to give you some uh, pointers and some feel for the sort of issues that we do wrestle with on these cases. And then at the end, we'll check in on a few other points of interest. Um, the LSLC is, is a famous talking shop and hopefully I can, I can pr promote a little bit of discussion. But we're seeing other trends such as the decline of the global salvage industry, uh, problems with ports of refuge. And even if you can salvage your vessel, um, we're seeing an exponential growth in the other costs associated with casualty management, such as management of waste, environmental cleanup, et cetera. Um, next slide, please. Um, MSC Napoli um, famously was the largest container ship in the world when she was built in 1991, um, became a high profile casualty in January 2007 when she uh, suffered structural failure in the English Channel. Um, she was beached in Branscombe Bay and was the subject of salvage and wreck removal services for uh, a period of three or four years thereafter. And uh, for us, that was the first modern container casualty where we really had to wrestle with container ship casualty management in the glare of public interest, media interest, and, and also the impact of social media. And a few years later, we experienced uh, two more container ship casualties, well known in their own right, the MSC Chitra, which was a collision in Mumbai Harbor, and the Rena, which is a case that Richard Saal is going to talk about a little later, another container vessel that founded on the Astrolab Reef off New Zealand in late 2011. Um, next slide, please. And really, those three casualties started the debate and the concern about the impact of much larger container ship casualties. And one indeed had, did happen. The MOL Comfort suffered a structural failure. Although salvage services were initially rendered, in fact, the whole vessel um, broke in two and subsequently sank. Um, she was about 8,000 TEU. If we go to the next slide, please, just to emphasize this point, here is uh, the uh, vital statistics of the Napoli and the Chitra and the Rena. And the point to take home here is, although these are large vessels in their own right, by modern standards, they're, they're very small indeed um, compared to the global container fleet. If we go to the next slide, please. And just to give illustration to that, here are, are three larger container vessels um, the Emma Maersk, Tripoli Maersk, uh, high profile, very large container vessels. And as I mentioned earlier, we're, ne we're now seeing ones uh, even beyond that. Next slide, please. So the first stage is the who and the what, as I describe it. There, there is no doubt, and it won't come as a surprise, that dealing with these cases is highly challenging and complex. But really, like any marine casualty, the three first priorities are life, property, and the environment. Um, but what makes container ship casualties so challenging is the sheer number of parties involved, many of whom have competing interests. But as a casualty lawyer, I would emphasize that um, coordination and cooperation is vital between the various stakeholders and the emergency responders. So the ability of the casualty community to work together to uh, achieve best outcomes is a vital feature of these cases. Of course, container ships, you're gonna have a, an owner, you're going to have time charterers who will be sub chartering to a variety of slot charterers, multiple contractual carriers, and thousands of cargo interests, some in insured. Talking to Amy earlier, she was telling me that they have seen as many as 37% of cargo uninsured. And of course, all of these have competing commercial interests, special relationships with key customers, special relationships with key suppliers. And of course, there'll be varying appetites for uh, absorbing the costs that arise from casualties. Um, and other features here are, are, of course, there are cultural differences. European operators may choose to manage casualties in a rather different style 
to uh, colleagues in Asia, for example. Okay, the next slide, please. And there's just, just a diagrammatic, diagrammatic representation of the contractual complexities here. So there's an awful lot of moving parts to these cases. I think that's what I want you to, to appreciate. Okay, next slide, please. So we've looked at the who and the, the what. Um, the next question is the, the where and the how. Um, and my first bullet point there is location, location. The, the point here is that there is a world of difference between managing a casualty like the Napoli um, in the UK waters where we were able to interact with the SOSREP, the Secretary of State's representative who has overall responsibility for managing casualties in our waters. That is a very different experience to managing a casualty in Australia or New Zealand, elsewhere in Europe or the USA. Quite early in your casualty management, you will have to wrestle with the question of, are we dealing with a salvage situation here? And if we are, uh, should we be signing Lloyd's Open form? Um, it's the oldest and still the most popularly used um, salvage contract, of course. Um, unique, I think, as an English law contract in that it puts the contractors to the very highest obligations of performance, best endeavours. So it's a high risk contract for them. And we're going to look a little bit more, both myself and Amy, at the interrelationship between salvage and GA. In my view, Lloyd's Open Form is absolutely appropriate for most container ship casualties involving fire, explosion, groundings. Um, it provides certainty. It can be agreed very easily um, and very quickly. Um, it is, of course, binding on all the salved property. So if the ship owner and his advisors and insurers decide to sign a Lloyd's Open Form, um, all the casualty will be carried, uh, the cargo on the casualty will be carried with them. And I think there's also an element of corporate responsibility here. Quite often, signing a Lloyd's form for a major casualty is the right thing to do. It's often what the coastal states will also expect to see. And it's also quite a good way for a ship owner to shift focus from his own issues and problems and putting the emphasis on the salvor's response to the casualty. In recent times, of course, we also have the, the additional flexibility that the scopic regime applies. Um, a very large container ship is of course a valuable asset and we have seen casualties where the cargo carried on board is, is as, as much as a billion dollars of value. Um, but on smaller cases where perhaps um, it is unlikely the vessel and cargo will survive its ordeal or there's a risk um, that most of the value will be, will be lost, scopic may be a feature of the case and of course that provides an additional incentive for the salvors to continue to respond and manage the casualty and of course there are huge logistical challenges here once the salvages services have terminated um, for less severe casualties sometimes um, commercial solutions may be available the cma cgm libra has become famous uh, of course as a, a case that's going to the supreme court dealing with um, defective passage planning and whether that is causative unseaworthiness. But in fact, that was a case where the owners and insurers decided to provide salvage security themselves and use the GA mechanism to try and claw those contributions back. So that was a, a one solution. And we've also seen uh, in smaller casualties where perhaps the exposure is known and can be measured in fairly the early days that the owners and perhaps the time charters and slot charters will actually just effectively divide the risk up. So so-called GA avoidance. And I think the other feature here is, is even if you have a salvage situation and you're able to manage the casualty in that way, that's not necessarily the end of the story. Um, uh, a modern feature of container ship casualties is the enormous costs of de dealing, for example, with contaminated firefighting water uh, waste management and end of life challenges in terms of what actually can you do with this enormous vessel if you need to scrap it or get rid of the vessel by way of um, dumping. Next slide, please. Um, quite an old slide now, but this is the Napoli and it just shows the flexibility of using a salvage contract where um, even though the vessel was a total loss um, and the casualty had originally happened in January, we decided to extend the life of the salvage contract to uh, provide a contractual mechanism for removal of the deck cargo, and then subsequently even the under deck cargo. 
So in fact, the, the life of the Lloyds form was extended to provide a mechanism for recovery of something like 85 to $90 million worth of cargo. Next slide, please. What are the practical issues then? Well, I think Amy's going to talk more about the logistical challenges, but it's important to recognize that to some extent there is going to be a competing claim here. Salvors will want their salvage security. That is due upon termination of services and redelivery at the property. Um, whereas general average security is due on delivery at the port of discharge. Um, but in fact, we find in practice, the salvage security is generally protected by local law more firmly. So you can see there's a reason for the ship owners and the contractors to actually work together um, in terms of instructing the same adjuster to collect both sets of securities at the same time. And other things we see, uh, huge pressure from coastal states. They just want the problem solved. They don't care whether it's going to be cost costly or not. And that may override contractual considerations as well. Okay, next slide, please. And other challenges here, there are huge political and environmental challenges. Bear in mind a salvage contract is only a contract for the vessel, salving the vessel and what's on it. Um, to the extent there are lost containers, that is going to have to find a different contractual mechanism and solution. There is huge public awareness, which brings pressure upon all of those managing these casualties, um, the, the so-called Napoli effect. There are also port of refuge concerns. When the Flaminia had an explosion of fire off uh, in the Western Approaches in 2012, it took at least six weeks for a port of refuge to be agreed. And really that, that isn't good enough despite the IMO directives. And as we've highlighted earlier, there are massive political challenges. Um, dealing with a casualty here is very difficult to dealing with a casualty in the USA, which will be managed by the US Coast Guard, for example. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, we now have the impact of the Basel Convention and the requirement for waste management, which will add cost and complexity to the tail end of the scenario in terms of uh, good practice and casualty management of a challenging container ship casualty. Okay, next slide, please. And just to give an indication of that, this is a, a look inside the hold of a, a major container ship fire. Um, this is not salvage, it's not rep removal. This is a whole huge area of liability where specialist contractors will be required firstly to remove the waste and then even more specialist contractors required to sort and ultimately dispose of the waste in accordance with international conventions and or applicable local law. Um, uh, so Andrew, quite, yes, Andrew, I'm sorry to jump in. Um, but I feel like one of those people who comes on at extra time, you know, premiership football, but I'm giving you a two minute sort of extension. Uh, I fully extended it and expected it, Simon. So Simon, okay. so bear Thank with you. me. We are near the end, sir. That's fine. Um, but, you know, quite often for a club, the, these ex exposures and liabilities may in fact be larger than, than the cargo claims in dealing with these container ship casualties. OK, and the next slide, please. We're going to skip that one. Uh, next slide, please. And then just to bring us up to date, these casualties have continued to happen. Uh, this was a near miss in Hamburg where a non salvage solution was found following a grounding. And then the next slide, please. The Jupiter is another major container ship that had a grounding event near the port of Antwerp requiring a huge number of local tugs to assist it. That was done in London Lloyd's open form. And then you can take the new next two slides quite quickly, please, just to bring us up to date, the Merck Honam and the Antion Express. Now, these are active cases. Uh, the Honam, probably the largest major casualty that we've seen, 15,000 TEU. Um, the Antion Express, slightly smaller. Both have used Lloyd's Open Form, both um, successfully in terms of providing a mechanism for resolving these casualties. And then just to draw this together, if we come to the last slide, please. Um, it isn't mission impossible. Um, the mechanics and Lloyd's Open Form and GA are interrelated and work quite well together, as Amy will demonstrate. There is, of course, a debate about whether container ships are too big and whether the firefighting arrangements that they have have kept pace with their size. And as I've mentioned earlier, one of the key things here and the hardest things to deal with, just the intense pressure that is brought, fueled by public interest, government pressure, and media scrutiny. Um, these cases, I'm afraid, they are going to happen. Um, 
the two billion dollar event has been modeled hopefully it doesn't happen but um you know we need to be ready for it when it does so i will take my cue to stop there so simon and hand back to you thank you very much andrew that was extremely interesting and i'm sorry to have sped you along a little bit um but anyway thank you can i now introduce amy o'neill Amy uh, joined Richards Hogg Lindley in 2006 after graduating from the University of Liverpool with a first class Bachelor of Science degree in psychology. She began working as an average adjuster at Richards Hogg Lindley in Liverpool and qualified as a fellow at the UK Association of Average Adjusters in 2013. She has spent time working as an associate director in the Singapore office and is currently the director responsible for overseeing the Liverpool office. She has experience of handling a variety of hull and machinery claims, as well as large container ship GA cases and GA um, salvage security uh, collections. And she's going to speak to us uh, now about container ship casualties, the average adjuster's perspective. So over to you, Amy. Thank you very much, Sir Simon. So I'm going to talk now a little bit about container ship casualties from the perspective of an average adjuster. Um, in particular, I'm going to look at some of the practical considerations and issues around the declaration of GA and also then the collection of GA and salvage security in these kind of cases. Um, can we move on to the first slide, please? So in the type of significant uh, container ship casualties that Andrew's just spoken about, um, there's rarely any doubt that a GA situation exists. Um, and at that time of the casualty, there'll be extraordinary sacrifices and expenditures being made or incurred for the common safety of ship and cargo. What is often unclear at that time is whether GA should be declared as a result of this. Um, and this is one of the first significant questions that we'd be looking at when we um, see a large container ship casualty. Because if GA is declared, the adjuster will be required to collect from every cargo interest on board the vessel um, security documentation. And this is, of course, a significant undertaking. Um, the number of cargo interests varies case by case. If we just look at an example, if, if we had a 12,000 TEU container ship, um, we could have anywhere between eight to 9,000 individual cargo interests on board um, that vessel, all of which that have to provide GA security before their cargo can be released at destination. So from the adjuster's perspective, um, when a casualty like this happens, the first question we'll be considering is whether a full declaration of GA is necessary and what options are available to owners. Can I have the next slide, please? So to enable the adjuster to consider the question further, um, it's really important that um, the adjusters are involved from the outset of the casualty situation. This is just so we can get a picture of the potential GA allowances from the outset and do a quick appraisal of the figures early on. So the type of thing that we'll be looking at um, is the potential GA allowances and then the likely costs involved. So an example, if we take, for example, a um, serious fire on board a vessel, the type of GA allowances might be things such as um, GA sacrifice damage to the ship, cargo and containers by extinguishing water. Um, also, the removal and disposal of extinguishing water from the vessel can be a factor. Um, the cost of discharging cargo, if this is necessary for repairs to the vessel. Um, we could have salvage costs. Um, for this exercise, it would be salvage costs outside of any LOF that was secured separately. Um, detention expenses, port charges, wages and maintenance of crew, fuel and stores, um, the cost of storing cargo as a potential GA allowance and reloading onto the original vessel after repairs have been completed. But more often than not, in these cases, um, we'd be looking at the forwarding costs um, as a substituted expense under Rule F. So we'd work in to get an, an idea of the potential GA allowances and the likely costs. We'd then move on to have a look at um, trying to assess the value of the property involved as best we can and um, that would involve looking at the extent of damages as well because of course we need to understand what the potential contributory values are. Um, there's a lot of unknowns of course when we're, when we're doing this in the early stages we won't have any cargo invoices but we'll be looking at things like you know the manifest description of the cargo, the trade, where the cargo is going from and to, um, identify any potentially very high significantly high value cargoes and likewise, any particularly low value cargoes or cargoes that can be excluded, such as personal effects, things like that. Um, once, we've, once we've done this, we can get um, an idea of everything together and we would apportion the costs to get an indication of the potential GA range. And we'd often look at a best and worst case scenario at this time and, and discuss this with owners. 
Can I have the next slide, please? As Andrew mentioned, in these kind of cases, of course, aside from the actual figures, there'll be other factors that owners are going to be considering when they're looking at whether to declare GA or not. You know, it could be a very serious casualty, it could have a lot of press attention, they've got their commercial relationships to consider. Um, they might not be particularly keen to have an average just to approach all of their customers for security documentation. Um, a lot of people aren't familiar with general average, so it can be quite, quite a, a significant thing to do to declare GA. Um, there's also the added cost and time to consider. So once we have the initial um, idea of the scale of the casualty and a potential GA costs involved, we're going to be looking to consider with owners whether it's going to be possible to maybe avoid a full collection. Um, in the past, we've been successful with this on, on some occasions. The first way to avoid a full security collection is really by ensuring that there's a suitable GA clause in the policy of insurance. And by suitable, I mean a, of a significant level that should a GA occur on one of the loaded container ship casualties, that it would it would um, be, be enough to potentially cover the GA expenditure. Um, likewise, if the operators are chartering in vessels, um, they, it's important that it's checked whether these vessels also have GA absorption clauses in their policies. And also that there are suitable provisions with regards to handling and the adjustment of GA within the relevant charter parties. All this makes the operations go much more smoothly should a, should a GA arise. So as I mentioned, in the case of a GA absorption clause, if the estimated GA expenditure falls within the agreed level, then there's no need to obtain security from cargo and owners can claim in full from their H&M insurers under such a clause. If there, if there isn't an absorption clause at a high enough level or any special insurance top up over and above the absorption clause, um, it may still be that the GA expenditure is fairly modest. And if that's the case, as Andrew mentioned, um, the parties involved can come to a special agreement over who will pay what proportion of GA expenditure, um, if this will be worthwhile to avoid the full security collection. And again, we've had this type of non-GA agreement also in the past. However, if the GA is a result of a very, very serious casualty with salvage and GA involved, um, it's often the case that the financial exposure is just too high for any one party to bear themselves or their insurers bear themselves. So obtaining um, contribution from cargo is the only way forward. Um, if this is the case and GA is going to be declared, our experience is that this is best done as soon as reasonably possible. Um, the adjusters will have made the preparations in place should you decide, should owners decide to declare GA. And um, declaring GA as soon as possible um, lets cargo know, know owner's intention and also means that we can hopefully prevent further delays down the line as well. Can I have the next slide, please? So the security it itself for GA is just an undertaking that upon delivery of the cargo, cargo owners and cargo insurers agree to pay the proportion of GA, which is ascertained as being properly and legally due from them under the adjustment. Um, a couple of points on security. Owners are entitled to a reasonable security from cargo. Um, and it's also an important to note in a container ship casualty that this security is really for all parties to the adventure. It's not just ship owners. In container ship casualties, there may be a high level of cargo GA sacrifice, for example, if there's water damage to car extinguishing water damage to cargo. And cargo may ultimately be a significant creditor under the adjustment. So their rights are protected under this security as well, and ship owners have an obligation to collect security on their behalf too. Um, another point that may be raised is that um, the question of fault um, may be a concern of cargo when they're asked to provide security. Um, however, rule, your counter at rule D does recognise the fact that although GA exists irrespective of fault or breach of contract by any of the parties, this doesn't prejudice any rights or defences that are open to the parties. Um, so this just generally allows for the GA to take take its course, um, actions be taken at the time of peril, the adventure completed, security provided, and all of the legal arguments can take place after the event. Um, the security form is an average bond from cargo receivers, an average guarantee from, in, from cargo insurers, and um, a copy of the commercial invoice. Um, if cargo is uninsured, we'd be required to have a cash deposit. 
Um, the form includes various clauses, some of which are, are more relevant to containership casualties, such as law and jurisdiction, um, time bar, non-separation agreement, if that's applicable. Um, and these are looked at on a case by case basis, depending on the details. Um, it's worth quickly mentioning at this point that CMI are actually working at the moment to put together an agreed standard wording for security documents. Um, this is supported by IUMI and BIMCO and, and they're going to act as a more self-contained undertaking with the key provisions um, actually included within the form itself. So this will hopefully make the whole process clearer for cargo interests and um, it won't require any background knowledge of GA. It will all be there on the form. So I think that's, that's a positive move and that should be available soon. Um, a couple of, of issues on containership casualties that, that complicate matters. The first is uninsured cargo. Um, the amount of uninsured cargo really does vary greatly case by case. It's very trade dependent. Um, we tend to start with 15 to 20% uninsured cargo, but we've seen much higher. And of course, we're going to be asking for a, a deposit from those interests. The second is um, LCL containers or consolidated containers. Um, depending on how many are on board, that can be a complicating factor. Um, these containers can have as many as 25 different cargo interests within the one container and, and we need to obtain security from all, all cargo interests before that particular container can be released. And it's very difficult to get any, anybody willing to take, you know, sign a letter of undertaking for that cargo and release it. So those are usually um, more difficult to deal with. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, if there has been a salvage security, a salvage, um, for example, under LOF and salvage security is required, the adjuster will often, well, usually be instructed as well to collect that security as well as the GA. It works quite well to collect both together, as Andrew mentioned. Um, the main point here is really that salvage security is in addition to GA security. Um, salvors will specify the requirements and the financial strength or jurisdiction of parties they'll be happy to collect security from. And this varies case by case, as does the percent that they're going to be asking for. Um, um, in the context of a container ship casualty, if we have a high amount of uninsured cargo, of course, they could, they've could they got to, to um, provide a cash deposit for salvage and GA. Um, and we do find the higher the percent, the combined percent of these, the more likely it is the uninsured cargo will just abandon their cargo at the port of refuge. So that's always something for owners to consider as well. Next slide, please. And just a final point to finish off on that's um, relevant in a container ship casualty is cases where we have salvage and GA involved again. So salvage right to an award is established by bringing the property to a place of safety. And once they're there, the salvage are crystallized. And um, salvage are entitled to exercise a maritime lien there and hold cargo at this intermediate port until salvage security is provided. Um, this is a contrast to GA, where owners have a possessory lien at destination for cargo's GA contribution. Um, in a serious casualty with, with a lot of cargo on board, um, there may be delays at the port of refuge if salvors insist that security is, is provided there. And, and often there's practical issues at the port of refuge as well. They might not have sufficient room to deal with all these containers and store them all. And of course, a delay at, at a port of refuge isn't ideal for anybody. It's something that the operators want to want to avoid and get things moving to destination where cargo is more likely to provide security. So um, if the amounts are relatively modest, the ship owner may just simply provide salvage security for the cargo and recover the salvage paid on their behalf in GA under the GA security. Um, if it's larger, the ship owner or the individual lines may provide interim security to the salvors by way of an ISU2 form, and then they'll undertake to hold the cargo at destination until salvage security is provided there. Um, obviously, I've, I've already mentioned that under English law, ship owners have a possessory lien on cargo at destination. There are a lot of practical issues as well around um, exercising lien at destinations. I mean, some places it's it's pretty much impossible or very difficult to hold cargo. So, in a container ship casualty where cargo is going all around the world, this is something that also requires attention. So that is a summary of some of the practical points from the adjuster's perspective, just purely on the declaration of GA and um, provision of, of security. Of course, the adjuster would be involved further in the production of the adjustment and distributing the adjustment at collecting funds, et cetera, at the end of the case. So there's more work involved. But um, I should close by saying that although these 
these container ship cases are, are getting significantly larger in size. Um, so if our capabilities really in handling these kind of security collections and casualties, um, I mean, in particular at RHL, we've been involved in handling many of these large container ship ca cases now, and um, with the involvement of more modern technology and having people experienced and dedicated to handling the collections, um, the exercise itself is, is pretty efficient and it's not, it doesn't take a significantly longer period of time, the fact that the, the vessels have, have become so much larger, although um, the largest so today is in the Maersk Honam, so uh, they're obviously larger vessels than that should that happen. Um, but no, the collection of security is generally quite straightforward and there are obviously difficult difficult containers that, that end up dragging out, but the whole process can go quite smoothly with GA and salvage security. So that's me finished. I will leave it there and hand back to Sir Simon. Thank you very much, Amy. That was fantastic. Um, so uh, the next speaker is Richard Saal, um, who is going to talk about some thoughts and liability and limitation proceedings. Richard, as has already been mentioned, is a tenant at Seven Kings Bench Walk, uh, where I also um, practiced before I became a judge. He was called to the bar in 2005. He specializes in disputes relating to international trade generally. He boasts um, a, a, a substantial tally of reported cases, uh, many of which um, are cases where he appeared unled, uh, which in the general, it was generally in the commercial court is actually quite rare. Um, he is ranked by Legal 500 as a leader, leading junior in the fields of shipping, commodities and insurance. He's a co-author of two leading textbooks, Carver on Charter Parties and Lowndes and Rudolph um, General Average and York Antwerp Rules. Um, he also, very unusually for a member of the bar, has taken um, the trouble from a very early stage of his practice uh, to gain other qualifications specifically relevant for tonight's purposes. Thus, he, uh, he holds an advanced diploma in shipbroking and chartering from the Institute of Chartered Shipbrokers and is an associate member by examination of the Association of Average Adjusters. His interest in container ship casualties specifically um, stems from his acting for ship owners in the Napoli case when led by uh, Tim Brenton QC. And since then, he's acted in a series of uh, large container ship disputes, including uh, the ongoing MESC. Honam uh, case, which has uh, been mentioned uh, by Amy just now and, um, and, and earlier uh, also by Andrew. Um, even better, um, I should point out that he has a Welsh speaking wife oh. and his children, despite living in West London, speak Welsh. Oh. He doesn't understand them, but um, hopefully we will understand him now when he talks to us. Thanks very much indeed. I can promise you I'm more conversant with this subject than, than with the, the Welsh language, um, if that's anything to be said. Well, it's a challenge to speak about any legal topic in only 15 minutes, but it's especially challenging to talk about container ship casualties. Uh, the first thing to say is that it's by no means a new phenomenon. Uh, we had a spate of cases in the late 90s and early thousands, uh, which involved uh, the shipment of sodium hypochlorite, um, a dangerous cargo often uh, not declared. Uh, I think that at one point there were about 21 different names under which sodium hypochlorite was being shipped. We've nevertheless had uh, an increased frequency in fire cases in recent years. Uh, I think that there have been about 15 or 16 a year over the last few years. And there's also been a recent spate of catastrophic stow collapses. Uh, since the 30th of November of last year, we've had about six uh, to the present date. Uh, and of course, uh, added to all of this, the ships themselves uh, are getting vastly bigger, uh, as Andrew and Amy have already been explaining. All of this poses huge challenges uh, for lawyers uh, and for a number of reasons. Uh, the first reason is just the sheer number of the parties involved. Uh, you can have claims which are going on in different jurisdictions with different approaches to package limitation, uh, with different um, uh, lawyers being retained to give legal advice. You've got the uh, need to collect GA and salvage security, as Amy has been explaining, which can be an enormous task. And, and if you're a ship owner who's bringing your recourse action against a charter or a shipper for loading dangerous cargo, you're going to need to bring all of that information together in order to pursue your action. So uh, that sheer number of parties. And we've also got the, um, the complexity of the root causes. 
But often the disputes will come down to the usual questions of liability under the Hague dispute rules and whether they've been incorporated or not. You have the ship owner who is seeking to show that he took reasonable care of the goods or perhaps trying to make out an exemption under Article 4 or 2. But or also might be uh, questions involved involving uh, initial uh, unseaworthiness. Uh, and it might prove difficult to show that you, the ship owner, have been exercising reasonable care in looking after the cargo, uh, where uh, the technology involved is highly sophisticated, uh, you've got logistics chains which are very complicated, uh, spread all over the world, and you might even have your operations department, again, based all over the world. Uh, and uh, very rarely do you see these cases, in fact, going to uh, court, um, part of that is that uh, these are typically expert-led cases, might be fields of expertise in uh, numerous different areas, costly to run, but typically settled. Uh, and that means that there's a dearth of authority from the commercial and admiralty courts on them. Uh, much of the challenge is handling uh, the disputes. Um, I regard that as uh, a role for my uh, solicitor's colleagues, uh, particularly to comment upon. To me, I think as a shipping barrister, to focus on some black law letter uh, issues, which I hope will be of use to you in uh, cases going forward. I'm gonna focus on three particular casualties uh, and for each of them, I'm gonna look at both the liability um, proceedings and the limitation proceedings. And with that, I'm gonna to turn to the first of them, which is the RENA, uh, the next slide. And uh, this is a casualty of 3,351 TU. We saw it up earlier, one of Andrew's slides, quite a small ship by modern comparisons. Uh, she grounded in a remote location off New Zealand on the 5th of October 2011. And uh, the reason was understood to be the result of um, navigational error by the crew. Uh, and the case is famous amongst other things for the very lengthy salvage operations that were provided uh, for a very long time under scopic terms. I think under scopic, the total liability was about $150 million. So if we just go over the slide to the limitation proceedings. We know two things about this case. We know that the ship owners obtained a general decree of limitation from London. And we know also that the charters did that as well. The line also obtained a uh, general decree of limitation. Um, so two things worth noting about this. Well, the first is, well, you might ask, why should the Admiralty Court in London have jurisdiction in this case, when the events occurred literally on the other side of the world? Uh, and the answer to that is, well, you can get limitation proceedings off the ground, provided you can serve the limitation claim form. Uh, and at common law, it can be relatively easy to do that. Uh, you can do that where, for instance, a claimant uh, agrees to uh, jurisdiction, I think the limitation defendant agrees to uh, the jurisdiction of the English courts, for limitation proceedings, but you might be able to find uh, a limitation defendant which is domiciled here, which has a branch here. Uh, and the second point uh, regarding the line uh, limiting, uh, well, there can be an, uh, advantages to them uh, obtaining their own uh, decree. They'll have a freestanding right to limit, uh, independent of the owners demonstrating their own entitlement. Um, the line might well be the main target for um, the cargo interests suing whether there are charters, bills of lading involved. Maybe the charters might be wary as to whether the owners will be able to demonstrate that they've got a right um, to uh, limit. There might be issues to do with breaking the limits. But, and so the charters can put all of that beyond doubt so far as they are themselves concerned by obtaining their own general limitation decree. Uh, and indeed, uh, where the ship owner has already put up his own limitation fund, or the charterer won't need to put on put up another fund himself. We can rely upon the fact that uh, a fund has already been constituted by the ship owner under Article 11.3 of the Limitation Convention. So there can be advantages readily obtained in doing so. So if we go on to the next slide, liability. We don't have a decision on liability from the reader. Um, but for another case involving a container ship uh, and a grounding, uh, we can look to the CMA CGM Libra. Uh, that's a case which is uh, going up to the Supreme Court, reached the Supreme Court in July. The case where uh, the uh, ship was held to be unseaworthy because of an improper passage plan. 
it was held that that was an attribute of the ship and therefore uh, something which made the, the ship unseaworthy and then it didn't fall within the nautical fault exemption in Article 4 Rule 2A of the Hakers Rules. Uh, and that's, um, uh, that's something which I just draw attention to as potentially relevant to the recent spate of uh, container ship um, stow collapses uh, which have been experienced in uh, extreme weather. Um, it might be relevant uh, to consider whether the uh, passage plan was uh, properly formulated, uh, whether the weather routing uh, was properly planned uh, from the commencement of the voyage, if the vessel has entered into extreme weather and there's been uh, a slow collapse. Um, in the CMA CGM Libra, one point uh, which didn't emerge uh, was what the position was as regards cargo that had been loaded at a previous port, so not the port from which the vessel has departed, uh, under the, uh, the relevant passage plan, but um, uh, rather at a previous port. Uh, and um, there's reason to think that in that scenario, these are the, the previously loaded cargo. Um, you could then, um, if you're the ship owner, rely upon the Article 428 um, error in the navigation exemption. So we move on now to the MSC Napoli. Um, this is a a container ship of 4,734 TU, again, small by modern standards. Uh, she suffered a structural failure in high seas in January 2007, uh, and she was beached uh, in uh, Branscombe Bay. Uh, many will remember the famous images of looters coming down to the beach uh, and taking away uh, BMW bikes uh, from containers that have washed ashore. Uh, for our purposes, it's uh, an important case because it was the first time a group litigation order, that's uh, CPR speak for a class action, uh, the first time that a group litigation order was made uh, in the shipping matter, uh, in, indeed the Admiralty Court. Uh, and so you had uh, in the group litigation proceedings, you had the uh, MSC as the charterers, you had slot charterers, you had NDOCCs, which are freight forwarders that are taking on uh, liability personally. Um, we had the freight forwarders also and cargo in trust, and they were all suing uh, the owners, uh, Zodiac Maritime. So if we go on to the next one. So uh, it all kept, got kicked off by uh, the ship owners constituting a fund uh, backed by um, their club in the amount of $14.7 million. Uh, and the ship owners would subsequently uh, contend that they uh, were not in fact liable um, in breach of contract and that the whole of the fund uh, should be returned to them. Um, ultimately, those liability proceedings uh, settled before it came on to trial. Just focusing here on the limitation aspects, well, there was a preliminary issue uh, trial as to whether the slot charters uh, could limit their liability under um, uh, the 1996 convention, because Article 1, uh, 2 of that convention refers to charters uh, being able to limit uh, did that apply here to slot charters? And Mr. Justice Tier held that it did. Uh, essentially, we're saying, well, uh, if that weren't the case, drawing a particular on uh, charters, if it weren't the case that charters could limit, then cargo interest would just pursue their uh, claims against the charters. The charters would have to bear um, more of the uh, liability themselves and couldn't pass it on to the head owners as they should. And so, well, that. Is a case also for slot charters, and slot charters should therefore be able to limit. It's mentioned in uh, Article 1 2, uh, why shouldn't they? Uh, one thing to notice here is that, uh, whereas it may well be the case, or it is the case that slot charters can limit, uh, it seems that NVOCCs uh, are left out in the cold. Um, they didn't apply for such a, 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 a preliminary issue, and it's perceived that they don't have that ability to limit. Uh, next slide. So going on to the uh, liability proceedings, in many ways, this is a conventional dispute. Uh, you have the cargo claiming that the vessel was unseaworthy, uh, alternatively that uh, the ship owner hadn't taken care in um, handling the cargo. Uh, and uh, they said that that could be inferred because the sea state was uh, unexceptional. And they focused on uh, the uh, potential presence of water in our void spaces. Um, and the, the owners were saying, no, actually, the, the sea state was quite exceptional. Uh, we did exercise due diligence, uh, but the um, situation was wholly unprecedented uh, and we didn't break our contract. Uh, we weren't liable. Just want to draw um, attention to one point, and that's that the Cargo Trust used a particular device 
uh, in their pleadings uh, of uh, alleging um, a bailment uh, directly against the head owners. Uh, we also see uh, claims in tort against the head owners. It might not bring things on further um, substantially, uh, but it might nevertheless give the cargo and trust the entitlement to claim disclosure from uh, head owners if they're alleging systemic failures uh, in the operation of the vessel, or perhaps even prove competence. They might just have a contract with uh, the charters, uh, charters bills of lading. They can use these uh, devices uh, to bring claims against head owners and thereby get disclosure. So we'll now just move on. Richard, can I give you your two minute warning as well? Okay. Please. So uh, this is the MSC Flaminia. Uh, and uh, already mentioned by Andrew, there was a major fire which was crossing the Atlantic from the Orleans uh, to Antwerp. Uh, sadly, three crew members were killed. Thousands of cargo containers were destroyed and the vessel was badly damaged. We move on to uh, the next slide. We don't actually have um, uh, any liability um, uh, proceedings, didn't have any liability proceedings in this jurisdiction, but we did in, in New York. Uh, you can find the case reports detailed there. Uh, and essentially it was a question of uh, the New York court examining all the different potential causes uh, that led to the uh, incident. Uh, and I just draw attention to the fact that um, as with any big accident, there's often not one single cause, there's usually a concatenation of causes. And so you can see them there, detailed on the screen, uh, the different uh, potential causes. Uh, and the judge there had to look at whether each of these potential causes carried liability uh, and whether or not they were legally causative. And it was ultimately held uh, that the shipper and the MPOCC uh, were liable for um, the shipment of dangerous goods. And that led to a uh, left open the possibility of a contribution action between the shipper and the MPOCC. Uh, and then I think I've just got time for my last slide on limitation. Um, we didn't have limitation proceedings in London, but we do have uh, the report of a similar case, CMA Carter. Uh, which involved um, the loading of uh, dangerous goods, so as uh, sodium hypochlorite. Uh, the, the charters were liable for shipping uh, those goods, and the owners sought to recover from the charters uh, $20 million for what, three things. The cost of repairing the vessel, um, the owner's liability to contribute in general average, because we think that there must have been a lot of cargo spoiled by the application of firefighting water, and then thirdly, uh, the owner's liability to cargo owners uh, for loss and damage to cargo under those separate contracts with uh, cargo owners. And the charters claimed a right to limit, which was uh, then disputed, until held that the first two of those uh, categories of claim were not limitable. Cost of repairing a vessel, owner's liability to contribute to general average, not limitable. But the third category was limitable um, for the purposes of the charter, could limit vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the owners who were suing, even though the charter was not acting qua ship owner. So he was entitled to make use of the concept of ship owner's limitation of liability, even though it wasn't acting as a ship owner, so instead uh, acting purely as a charter. And there was doubt as to whether that was correct, but it was put to bed in the Ocean Victory a few years ago, which you remember for a, as a safe port case, and it was confirmed that it was. So, um, so just to conclude, as with uh, line of trades generally, uh, we've all been tonight operating under a tightly scheduled service and there has been um, no real opportunity for uh, slow steaming. Uh, I hope this has proven a useful tour of some of the legal issues that arise. Uh, like other members of the audience, I'll be happy to answer any questions you have uh, uh, with that. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed, Richard. Um, uh, you can never trust barristers to be on time, I find, with their submissions. And uh, there's another example. Uh, but no, seriously, well done, Richard. Um, OK, so I think um, now we are at the Q&A uh, session. Um, as, and I know that some questions have been sent in in advance. And I understand questions have been coming in uh, during the course of uh, the um, addresses. So we're going to do our best to um, answer those questions. And the way it's going to work is that Jonathan has the questions and he's going to read them out one by one. We'll probably just get three or four, I would have thought, maximum. And then um, I will do my best to allocate the questions to an appropriate member of the panel. Jonathan. 
Okay, Simon. So, uh, yes, indeed. Um, number of questions received beforehand and a good number during the session. Um, good place to start, I thought, uh, one from Charles Baker during the session uh, as follows. A number of container ship casualties seem to involve cargo fires, which in the worst case is, in the worst cases involve or cause explosions uh, leading to the loss of the vessel. In the panel's experience, roughly what percentage of cases are attributable to cargo as opposed to negligent navigation? Um, okay, well, I mean, I don't want to limit any of the panelists, but I would. I wonder whether, Andrew, that would be one for you. Uh, yeah, happy to have a go. Um, I, I think the fire and explosion cases get more profile because they tend to be more dramatic and more serious. So as Richard said, we, we've kind of been there before with the uh, the hypochlorite cases. There were a whole rash of them, Jakarta, the Aconcagua, um, a few others I forgot the names of. Um, I don't know what the statistics are in terms of the breakdown, but I think um, in my experience, container ship groundings are, are more manageable. You probably have more time to think about whether you need a salvage contract, uh, more time to get a handle on the exposure and the possible claims. Um, and therefore more opportunities perhaps to manage the casualty in a creative way. Um, with a fire and explosion, as I think I alluded to, I think if you don't make fast decisions, probably to award an LOF to a major contractor, knowing that that's gonna lead you down the GA route in the fullness of time, um, you probably will be criticized for that. And you know, you, you can't afford to take that choice. That isn't responsible. Um, it is worth bearing in mind as as values currently sit if you do have one of these casualties you know the the relative value of the ship particularly once it's damaged is often five percent of the total fund ten percent so the money is not in the ship um, the ship owner has the burden of managing the casualty but the money is in the cargo and the containers and sometimes the the bunkers themselves if they've just stemmed these largest vessels that will be $30 million of, of bunkers on board. So I've probably dodged the question, but I've done my best with it. <laughs> Did either of the, um, uh, Amy or Richard want to um, follow up on that? You don't have to. Uh, Alex, Simon, if it's okay with you, I think yep. we, uh, if we move on, we've got yep. um, try and get as many of these in. Um, yep. This one is specifically addressed to, to Amy. Dear Ms. O'Neill, I've seen that the CMA CGM or uh, um, or I've seen that CMA, CGM, uh, and Maersk are still using the 1994 York Antwerp rules in their contracts of carriage. Considering that these are some of the companies owning numerous mega container ships, I am wondering whether the 1994 version is, a, is more suitable to address the average adjustment issue created by these new types of mega, vest, uh, mega box ships than the newer uh, 2016 York Antwerp rules. I mean that Sorry, Sir Simon. No, no, you've made my task easy. Thank you very much. Um, Amy, over to you. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think this, the short answer is no, no, I don't think that the 94 rules are more suited for general average on um, megabox container vessels than the 2016. I actually think that the changes that were made in the 2016 rules make it um, offer a lot of practical solutions and they put they allow adjusters to fill in the gaps when a lot of the information isn't present, um, which should save a lot of time. Um, the the 2016 rules have been quite well supported, and I think that um, well, I know that BIMCO have incorporated them into their latest versions of the charter parties and the bills of lading. So I think with the kind of thing, it takes a while to just filter through. Really, I don't see there's any particular reason why they wouldn't be used, and that 1994 rules were any better. The the only real there's no real significant changes to the um, allowances in GA apart from the removal of commission and the interest being changed to follow the LIBOR rate. So no, I would. I don't think um, 1994 rules are, are better suited. I think it just takes time to Thanks. pass through. Thank you, Amy. Jonathan, next one. Um, just to mention, uh, Simon, quickly, because uh, that question was from a student at, at um, City University. So I just, uh, he did, he, he sent it with his name. So just to credit him, uh, it was a Mr. Theodore uh, Fishiak, who is a student at City. Um, next question. Um, th th this is an anonymous one. 
uh, it's quite a technical one. Uh, there have been problems in the past with the misdecoration of container weights. To what extent has that problem been resolved? How does it affect the shipper's charter's obligations in relation to dangerous goods? Is that something, Richard, you could help with? Can help with that one? Well, yeah, this is something which um, has been spoken about a lot in the past. I think um, some people thought it might have been uh, the cause of the uh, Napoli incident, um, uh, misdecoration of uh, container weights. Um, there, there, were, there was a big study uh, done by uh, some Danish consultants from Marin, uh, which resulted in uh, some amendments to SOLAS, um, whereby you have to uh, submit verified gross mass uh, information and a period before uh, loading. Uh, but you also hear, I think, that um, it hasn't entirely uh, resolved the problems uh, in the industry. Um, it's not universally um, uh, taken up in all countries, and uh, it's still thought to be a problem. Um, in terms of the problems themselves, uh, you can have instances of stove collapses, even see one case where there was a collapse that figured that the cap size of a, a small container ship uh, alongside. Um, obviously, the, these amendments to SOLAS or, or else even um, we're talking about the IMGG code, uh, what's, what's prescribed as regards dangerous goods, that's all going to inform uh, the standards which uh, are expected of uh, charters and shippers. But you will have anyway uh, duties at uh, common law and under. Article 4, Rule 6 of the Hay Fisby Rules uh, in terms of not uh, loading uh, dangerous goods. Uh, and uh, these uh, changes to SOLAS, IMGG Co, uh, they're not going to dilute in any way uh, the content of the obligation that you're anyway going to um, be under at, at common law. Uh, so there have been some developments, but in other respects, the obligation remains the same. Thank you, Richard. Jonathan. Um, Simon, um, so um, we, we're getting near the end of our time, and it's interesting, there's a number of overlapping questions here, uh, really going to the future um, of general average. Um, I just put them quickly. Um, there's one which is particularly about the LOL, LOF itself. Is the LOF fit for purpose in terms of managing container ship casualties? But if I may just bring in, uh, there have been, uh, on top of that, there's a more general uh, questioning of the almost the, um, the, the sort of an exi existential question as to the future of general average. For example, do you think there is a continued need for general average? Does GA have a place in the modern in modern commercial shipping? That's anonymous. But then Sasha P um, on the link here asks a, si a similar question. Um, is there a need to revise current legal regime? Um, and then there's also from, um, uh, from uh, Keith Jones at Aon, um, who says the Rodians could not have envisaged a casualty which might concern some 3,000 interests, and surely the container industry should find their own solution to a large casualty problem, as opposed to relying on a costly and no doubt lengthy general average security collection and adjustment. Insurers have previously talked about cover to provide security and pay cargo's contribution to salvage and general average, which could provide a solution. So, Simon, if I can throw that th through you well, to the floor, I, it's I a, think about should, the form itself. Yep. Yeah, I think we should require an answer from each of the panelists, and that would probably then wrap things up. So go on, Andrew, you go first. Uh, okay. Um, well, I, I think I mentioned I, I thought LOF can work quite well. Um, and in fact, if you're dealing with the back end of LOF cases, there's been a lot of fine tuning of the mechanics of Lloyd's form to make it actually easier for the contractor to get his award. So notification requirements have been simplified. If you have settlements, the ability to get those settlements rubber stamped and as, a, as an award against the unrepresented cargo has all been streamlined and simplified. Um, so far as GA is concerned, um, I think Amy's explained um, the Dickensian pace of GA in the past. I think the Jakarta adjustment famously took 15 years. Whereas um, credit to Amy's company on the HONAM, I think all the GA securities were collected inside nine months from terminations, which is extraordinary. So although it's going to take a few years, it is a much quicker and much more streamlined process. And I think, you know, you know without general average, you can't have the stakeholders looking at a liability and finding commercial solutions like GA avoidance, um, where they just say, look, we'll, we'll self-insure this effectively. So 
for certain casualties up to a certain size, there are practical creative solutions and stakeholders are embracing those. And, you know, people like me who, who like creative solutions, we can help them with that. Um, Thank you, Andrew. Ultimately, the, well, I was just going to, if I may, the insurance solution is a really interesting debate. Um, this has been looked at. There was one line that had an insurance solution and it, it didn't really work in practice. There was the landmark initiative, which got a lot of quite a lot of traction, which had some mechanical problems and the idea of ship owners paying for another level of insurance didn't happen. So I think think the time probably has come for an insurance solution, but that really is um, a topic for another day. There's a whole whole hours debate over that, um, which we can have another time, perhaps. Thank you, Andrew. Amy. Um, I agree with everything Andrew said, really. I mean, the GA, GA losses expenditure won't go away, even if we didn't have the concept of GA to, to deal with the division of the costs and, and, and that kind of thing. So the York Andrew rules offer a framework for how, how these costs are divided. And yeah, if there are other solutions, then, then that's great too. But I, I don't think it kind of does away with GA. Richard, thank you. I don't think I can better what uh, Amy and Andrew have just said on that. Right. Well, I'm sure tonight's debate, uh, or not debate, discussion has um, certainly demonstrated, if nothing else, apart from the um, great expertise of our three panellists, um, and I know we all, if we were here, would now give them a clap. I'm not going to suggest we do that virtually because it would be a little odd. However, there is a clap, I think, from everybody. Um, but I think what also our, uh, the panellists in their discussions and contributions have, have made clear is that this is actually very much a progressive area. And uh, we can talk about old concepts of GA and old forms and so forth, but actually through practitioners, you, you the three of you being good examples, um, uh, and through just having to deal with practicalities and the ever bigger ships. I thought, Andrew, your particular um, slide showing just how massive some of these container ships are was very instructive in itself. Um, so uh, that was my little contribution. Um, I did want to reiterate uh, my thanks, our thanks to uh, uh, Jonathan, in fact, for um, helping arrange everything and um, the whole of your team at HFW um, and, um, and then to the um, panelists again. Thank you ever so much. And thank you from my side uh, for um, giving me the privilege of um, taking part, albeit in a very modest way. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Simon. Um, just to endorse those uh, those thanks that you've already made to the three panelists, I, th I thought that was fascinating and I hope the audience have enjoyed it. Just um, on a point you'll all be interested in, um, we got up to over 330 uh, participants on the call, close to 350, I was watching the counter, which is outstanding. So. Um, that's brilliant. Um, just a few uh, a few points to finish off with. Um, please do fill in the, um, if you can, take a moment to fill in and complete our feedback form. Um, and, and then uh, uh, having, you know, thank the panelists, it remains for me um, to, to, to thank um, Sir Simon Pickin very much for carving the time out of his busy diary to be with us today uh, and, 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 and share the proceedings in such a succinct um, and empathetic manner. Um, that thank, thanks is is made on um, a behalf, um, as you know, it's it's an LSLC event which we're hosting, so very much made on behalf of um, of also on behalf of Dr. Leica Shepherd, uh, my professor from many years ago, uh, the founder and chairman of the LSLC. Uh, a fascinating event, as I say. Thank you very much to everyone. So Simon, thank you again, um, and then just two. Another point for the LLC, LSLC, um, uh, the next event in their lecture series is, um, the, it, it's, it's discussing the eternal bliss case. Uh, this will be the next webinar and that will take place on Wednesday, 17th March uh, at the same time at 5 p.m. Um, and I think that's it. Just to thank our own team on behalf of Andrew and myself, our own team at HFW with on the hosting at Sharon King uh, and her excellent te team, uh, Leah, um, Katie and Natalie. Thank you very much, everyone, uh, and have a wonderful evening.